Eva. The wonderful Mr. Robert Friedman, just to my right, will explain his time signals to you now. All right, everyone. <clears throat> Say our time signals. Give you about five seconds to look over the quotation. <clears throat> let you know when time begins. I'll give you 30-second verbal warnings during your preparation time. So 30, one minute, one thirty. Then I'll give you hand signals from five minutes on down. A 30-second left warning, 15-second left warning, and the last five seconds. And this means shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and do. Um, so, with no further delay, we will begin with H1, Alyssa Boats. And, of course, all the other ones get the hell out. Time begins. Thirty seconds. One minute. Mindy Crandell may have been the unluckiest woman who ever lived. <laughs> now, if you don't know, this is a woman in Tallahassee, Florida, who went to a gas station to purchase a lottery ticket. Now, an elderly woman named Gloria McKenzie was behind her in the line, but had a few less items, so Mindy let her go ahead. Now, Gloria also had a quick pick lottery <laughs> ticket and ended up winning $195 million, <laughs> a mistake by Minnie. Now, at first, Minnie was a little upset with the decision that she made, but she realized that she was happy that she let someone else have the opportunity because she let her actions rather than her words drive her decision. And it's this idea that leads us to today's quotation, which is an Apache proverb. It is better to have less thunder in the mouth and more lightning in the hand. What this proverb highlights is that sometimes we want to act on impulse or speak our words as much as we can. However, it is ultimately what our actions do that drive the decisions what we, that we make. So what we can take from this quotation is that we must let our actions drive our decisions. And we can agree with this in two ways. First, it allows us to avoid acting on impulse. And second, it helps censor our communication. First, just like Mindy Crandell didn't act on impulse of wanting to go first in the line and avoiding the $195 million lottery, we can see when we let our actions drive our decision, it allows us to avoid acting on impulse. We can see this through looking at Maria Bell Boyd, and second, the Stanford Prison Experiments. First, Maria Bell Boyd was actually a spy for the Confederacy during the Civil War back in the 1800s. Now, at first, she was looked down upon because she was female in her role of a spy. However, she always let her actions drive her decisions rather than her words. Specifically, one day, she was walking down the street, and a drunken Union soldier st started to insult she and her mother. So she decided to punch him in the gut in order to get the information that she needed, with absolutely using no words as possible. Because she acted on her actions, that was able to drive her decision, 
rather than using her words to verbally assault the soldier that she wanted to do so with. Thus, it was her actions that drove her decision rather than her words. Further, we can see the same idea exemplified through the Stanford Prison Experiments. This was an experiment in 1979 and was a sociological experiment to see whether or not people adapt to roles that they're assigned. Now, this was a group of young men ages 20 to 30, and they were assigned in a prison, either a prisoner or a guard. Now, these men in this experiment had no rules on how they had to act. However, these men started ingraining themselves into the role so completely that the guards actually ended up treating the prisoners cruelly. These men let their actions drive their decisions because a lot of the communication was nonverbal the entire time. Thus, they were not able to act on impulse, but they were able to ingrain themselves in the role and conduct a productive experiment. So through Maria Bell Boyd and the Stanford Prison Experiments, it's clear that when we let our actions drive our decisions, it allows us to avoid acting on impulse. But further, we can see that when we let our actions drive what we do, rather than just blurting the first thing out of our mouth, it helps us properly censor our communication. It's clear that when we drive, let our actions drive our decisions, it helps us censor our communication. By looking at the classic novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God, before second, the creation of nail polish. <laughs> first, in the classic novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God, we follow the main character, Janie, who is extremely unhappy in an arranged marriage that she is in. Now, at first, she decides not to talk to her husband for many months in order to avoid conflict. She decides that she wants to run away with a new man instead, but took a long time deciding on what she wanted to do. She ended up leaving her husband without saying any word to him at all and was able to be happier, but she did this because she censored her communication and let her actions drive the decision that she ultimately wanted to make. Further, we can see the same idea exemplified through the creation of nail polish. Now, you may not know that 5,000 years ago in China, it was totally illegal to wear nail polish if you were not from the higher class. Now, people, the brighter your nails were in China 5,000 years ago, the more power you were said to have. And people, who act, people could actually get executed if they were wearing bright nail polish or nail polish at all. Now, the people in that time wanted to use this action as a communication form in order for them to distinguish the wealthy class from the lower class. Thus, they were able to let their decisions drive their actions and thus, this communication form of the nail polish was censored throughout the entire era. So by their eyes were watching God and the creation of nail polish, it's clear that when we let our actions drive our decisions, it can help censor our communication appropriately. So in returning to today's proverb, it is better to have less thunder in the mouth and more lightning in the hand. We agree, because we must let our actions drive our decisions. We saw this through first, seeing that it allows us to avoid acting on impulse. And next, it helps us center our communication. So when looking back to Mindy Crandell, she can see that we can see that she definitely let her actions drive her decisions, whether or not you agree that it was the right choice to abandon $195 million. <laughs> Maybe excuse please. Absolutely. All right, next up we have E1, Daniel Wheaton.
30 seconds. One minute. One thirty. In his more than 20 years in the Nebraska unicameral legislature, Omaha Senator Brad Ashford has done nearly everything he could to resolve a variety of issues facing Nebraska, most notably the problem with Nebraska's prisons. Over the past 20 years, Nebraska's prisons have become dangerously overcrowded. So Astrid has been trying to do everything he can to make sure that we finally resolve this conflict, be it by building more prisons or trying to get less individuals put inside them. Essentially, rather than creating conflict, Astrid is doing everything he can to resolve it. And it is that same idea that is reflected in today's quotation, which is a Apache proverb, which is a Lakota proverb. Force, no matter how concealed, begets resistance. What this proverb is trying to tell us is that whenever we try to resolve an action using force, Ultimately, we will get resist resistance, even if it is a good idea. Because of this, we must agree with today's quotation because peace is the only way to resolve a conflict. We can discuss this by looking at these two main reasons. First, because sometimes we have to admit that we're wrong. And secondly, because we should always seek resolution instead of vengeance. Let's discuss the first reason why peace is the only reason to resolve conflict, because sometimes we have to admit that we're wrong. We can first see this by analyzing the dialectic and applying it to the story of Thanor and the Silmar Land. First, the dialectic states is that we always have something we support, a thesis, things that we don't, an antithesis. These things exist into a constant struggle until we come with some kind of resolution, a thesis. Basically, we have discussions until we resolve any kind of conflict. But when we introduce theses that contradict someone or challenge their beliefs, this naturally creates a kind of conflict. In some cases, this can end up with a positive solution, but sometimes it won't. And an instance where, it, where it, this didn't happen was the story of Feanor in the Silmarillion. The Silmarillion, which is the book that provides all of the historical background to Lord of the Rings, is a really nerdy book. <laughs> and Feanor was known as the best elven smith. He created these jewels known as the Silmarils. They essentially contained the light of all the stars. These gems were so beautiful that the Dark Lord, Melkor, tried to steal them. And after a series of conflicts, all of Feanor's people decided to do everything they can to get the, the Silmarils back from Melkor after he stole them. They raged wars with Melkor for over 400 years, until the gods had to get involved and a good chunk of the earth fell into the sea. That's how beautiful these duels were. Because of this, Feanor was, wasn't willing to, solve, to create a peaceful conflict. Instead, he beget more and more conflict, because he never admitted that he was wrong. He never admitted that a different kind of resolution could have solved this problem, and instead, creating the entire history of the first age of Middle-earth. So, after discussing the dialectic, and applying it to Feanor, it is clear, sometimes we have to admit that we're wrong, otherwise there will be a big change in geography. <laughs> However, we can discuss the second reason why peace is the only way to truly resolve conflict, because we should always seek a resolution instead of vengeance. We can discuss this by first discussing motivated reasoning and applying those ideas to Iranian politician Hassan Rouhani. First, motivated reasoning is a theory in psychology and political science stating that as individuals, we always seek out ideas that reinforce our own personal views. So if you're liberal, you're going to like MSNBC and hate Fox, and if you're conservative, it's just the opposite. We seek out information that essentially supports our own views. But because of this, this doesn't allow us to seek resolution. By only having echo chambers, all that we really do is create further conflict, rather than actually talking about the issues at our hand. We essentially turn in from the other side and only repeat our own views, which is entirely dangerous which is why we should always seek resolution, rather than creating further vengeances by, being so, uh, by believing so much into our own views, which may be flawed. And we can view this and the changes that Hassan Rouhani has made in Iran. Hassan Rouhani was recently elected president about a year ago, and he has essentially allowed for some liberalization of Iran. 
he had a number of contact with President Barack Obama discussing how to thaw relations between Iran and the United States. So rather than maintaining the status quo of us just glaring at each other and saying mean things, Hassan Rouhani has actually tried to change the status quo. Instead of seeking vengeance for the mistakes we made with the Shah and the Iranian Revolution, Rouhani is trying to essentially create a new solution by seeking resolution instead of vengeance. So, as long as we work trying to resolve our conflicts, rather than creating further ones along the road, we can essentially avoid the mistakes that we have made in the past. But, when we let all of our own personal beliefs, created by motivated reasoning, get in the way, this ultimately detracts from what we intend to do, and can ultimately harm our chances on creating a peaceful resolution, which is something that we should always seek to achieve, no matter what we do in our own lives. So, after discussing motivated reasoning, and applying it to Hassan Rouhani, it is clear that we should always seek a resolution, instead of vengeance. So, when we turn to today's quotation, force, no matter how concealed, begets resistance, resistance a Lakota proverb. We agree to today's quotation because peace is the only way to truly resolve conflict. Because first, sometimes we have to admit that we're wrong to the dialectic in Feynor. And secondly, discussing how we should always seek a resolution instead of vengeance through motivated reasoning as Hassan Rouhani. Brad Astrid has been doing nearly everything he can to resolve conflict, rather than creating fights in unicameral. And as he attempts to go against Lee Terry in the upcoming election in Omaha, he is essentially going to create a new discussion and hopefully challenge the politics of Nebraska. Thank you. Absolutely. Awesome. I will send you Shane. All right, next up we have E6 Shane Krauss. Time begins. seconds. One minute.
While learning physics, one of the classic examples in order to teach mechanics is the classic horse and wagon approach. Throughout this approach, we learn that the horse applies force on the wagon, but the wagon applies an equal and opposite force on the horse, and the only way that they're able to actually move is if one of them overcomes the friction. We can apply this to today's quotation by Lakota proverb, force, no matter how concealed, begets resistance. What this quotation is trying to tell us is that in whatever situation we are in, there's going to be some resistance or conflict, and we must overcome it. And we can interpret this quotation to tell us that we must embrace our conflicts, because they make us better. And we can agree with this quotation for two main reasons. First, because conflict pushes us to think smarter, and second, because conflict forces us to try different approaches. To begin, we will see that we must embrace our conflict, because it will push us to think smarter. And we will see that this is true through three examples. First, through Tales of Symphonia, and second, through Race to the Sun. First, Tales of Symphonia is a game produced by Namco, in which we follow the main character, Lloyd, as his journey to save the world. Throughout his journey, he ends up gaining many companions on his side. However, one of his companions, Zelos, ends up being a traitor and working for the other side. Lloyd realizes this, and instead of simply turning Zelos away, he realizes that he must overcome this conflict and think smarter. So instead, he, trained, he turns Zelos from the evil side to the good side, and instead uses him as an informant, turning him against his former peers. By doing this, he was able to turn a conflict that could have been detrimental to his mission, and in turn, turned it into something that he could use for success. Second, we can look to Race to the Sun. In 1986, when solar power was first starting to become popular, Australia decided to hold a national race to see who could build the fastest solar car to travel from the northernmost point of Australia down to the southernmost point. Initially, there was a lot of conflict because countries weren't exactly sure what to do. However, Japan decided to embrace on this, and instead of dealing with the same problems that other countries were doing, trying to get as much solar power as possible, they instead tried to make a small, lighter car that would be more efficient. And by doing this, they in turn won the race, giving their nation the glory. Because they were able to embrace this conflict and look past it, they were able to be successful. Through Tales of Symphonia and Race to the Sun, it's clear that by embracing conflict, it forces us to think smarter, getting us to better outcomes. Second, we can see that we must embrace our conflict because it pushes us to think differently. And we can see this through the examples of The War by Margaret Duras and Crumbs. First, The War is a memoir by Margaret Duras, which details her time throughout the Holocaust. While in Germany in 1940, the Nazis began storming the city and took her husband into a concentration camp. She was very distraught over this and knew that she had to do something in order to ensure his safe return to combat this. Although it was very dangerous, she decided to infiltrate the camp and become an administrative worker. By doing this, she in turn was able to find her husband and ensure that he would be kept safe. Throughout the memoir, it tells of how she was able to bring him out of the camp and rehabilitate him into the normal world. Because this conflict forced her to think smarter and give her different ideas of infiltrating the camp, even though it was extremely dangerous, she did this and ended up accomplishing her goals. Because she was able to embrace the conflict and overcome it, she was able to be successful. Second, we can look to Crumbs, better known as Michael Santana, who is a player for the major league gaming team Dignitas in North America. They specialize in playing the game League of Legends, just last week, in the North American regionals, Dignitas was up against the number one seat, Cloud9, in which Crumbs was in which Crumbs was in charge of making the shots, calling the shots. Over the course of this game, they started falling behind. However, once he realized exactly what they needed to do, they began thinking more creatively, changing around their lanes and making the game a different landscape. By doing this, they were able to turn the tides of the game and come out being successful taking out Cloud9 from the number one seat. Because he was able to embrace this conflict, even though they started out behind, with some clever thinking, they were able to overcome it and ended up winning the game. Through the examples of the war by Margaret Duras and through Crumbs, we see that by embracing this conflict, they were forced to think more creatively. And returning to the quotation today, by a Lakota, by a Lakota proverb, force, no matter how concealed, begets resistance. This is trying to tell us that we must embrace our, our conflict because it's not going anywhere. And we saw we can agree with this quotation in the sense that we must embrace our conflicts to be more successful. 
And we saw that we can agree with this for two reasons. First, because it pushes us to think smarter. And second, because it makes us think more creatively. Taking both of things into consideration. Just like in the example with the horse and the wagon, in all situations, if the horse or the wagon wants to get anywhere, they're going to first have to overcome friction. And if they embrace this, they'll be able to think of a better, more creative, and smarter way to do this. Next up, we have H4, Ashley Coons. Time begins. Thirty seconds. One minute. One thirty. During the 19th century, whenever we had to go to the doctor's office, it was really incredibly painful and the only form of anesthetic was alcohol. So it sucked. A lot. <laughs> Enter physician Edwin Katsky. Katsky, a Nebraskan physician, was found, discovered a new drug called cocaine that was rumored to have anesthetic properties. Now, because ethically you can't just shoot this drug into people and hope for the best, Katsky decided to try it out on himself and try to truly understand the anesthetic properties from his own perspective. However, Katsky didn't really realize the consequences of what he was doing. So although his actions were inherently good, they did have an unwanted consequence, which was the fact that he became addicted to cocaine and may or may not have overdosed a few times. Now, although his research was absolutely groundbreaking and led to a revolution in anesthetics, the fact that Katsky did not realize that his, con his actions had consequences caused a lot of issues for him. And this leads us directly into today's quotation from L a Lakota proverb, force, no matter how concealed, begets resistance. Now, this highlights the fact that no matter what, like when it, or no matter what action is being taken against us, 
we're going to see a reaction on our part. So whenever force is applied, resistance will also be applied, whether that's good or negative. We can see that from this, we must accept consequences as a result of action, and we can agree with this for two reasons. First, because it forces us to consider others, and second, because it enables us to actually take more risks in the future. But initially, Katsky had to take in the considerations of others when he was shooting himself with cocaine. Now, obviously, he wasn't considering himself, but he was considering how his actions were going to impact those around him, and thus that drove his actions in the first place. We can see that when we accept consequences are a result of actions, it forces the consideration of others because it makes us actually think about what we're doing on a deeper level. And we can see this further exemplified through the video game Heavy Rain and through the discovery of gamma radiation. But initially, Heavy Rain. In this video game, protagonist Ethan Mars finds that his son Sean has been kidnapped by the notorious origami killer. And in order to get him back, Ethan must go through a series of trials that are written on, sh on sheets of origami paper. These trials are extremely dangerous in nature and could get Ethan killed, but he realizes that because of his, that his actions do have consequences, namely saving his son, he goes through with them anyways because those consequences are worthwhile for him in the end. Next, the discovery of gamma radiation. Now during the, 19, or during the, time, the, the Cold War, we were experiencing a new type of radiation that was coming into the United States and nobody knew it was, what it was from, and so immediately we decided to say, well, this is the Soviets doing, they launched a new bomb. However, once scientists in the 1960s decided to actually understand what was going on before jumping to consider conclusions, actually taking into consideration the consequences that their actions might have, they realized that maybe starting a war with the Soviets isn't a good idea, and this is actually something else entirely, gamma radiation. So we can see that through heavy rain and through the discovery of gamma radiation, when we accept consequences as a result of action, it forces us to consider others. But next, Katsy took major risks once he realized that his actions did have consequences, and those consequences would likely be positive for those involved. We can see that when we accept consequences as a result of action, it enables risk taking because it allows us to see that what we are doing is actually worthwhile in the long run. We can see this further exemplified through the novella, Story of the Eye, and through John Murray Spear. But initially, the story of the eye. In this rather graphic, French erotic novel, whatever, we see the story of a nameless narrator who is head over heels and fall in love with this girl named Simone, who's into some really, really, really kinky things. Now, the narrator realizes that he doesn't really want to be into this, but he cares about Simone so deeply that he's willing to accept the consequences of his actions of being with her, and as a result, he allows him to actually take those risks and be with her and try all these new things, such as going to bullfights and traveling throughout the French countryside, because he knows that those consequences are worthwhile in the end. But next, John Murray Spear. Spear was an eccentric who lived in the United States at the turn of the 20th century and was fascinated with electricity. So he did what any sane human being would do and started a religion around it. Now, Katsky decided to build a robot god for his electricity religion that channeled the spirits of Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin and, needless to say, failed. But because he accepted these consequences were part of a result on failures in his own actions, it enabled him to keep going and keep trying these new things until he finally got it right. And although he didn't, want, he didn't have a fully successful religion, he still had a cult with several thousand followers. So we can see that through the story of the eye and through John Murray Spear, when we accept consequences as a result of action, it enables risk taking. So we're returning to today's quotation, a Lakota proverb. Force, no matter how concealed, begets resistance. We took from this that we must accept consequences as a result of action, and we agreed with this for two reasons. First, because it forces consideration of others, and second, because it enables risk taking. So Katsky, he revolutionized anesthetics, all at the risk of his health.
All right, next up is E2 Gray Solemn Fiber. <laughs> Thirty. One minute. One thirty. At the turn of the 20th century, China had a problem. They felt that their country, compared to their Western allies, seemed backwards and strange. And one of the biggest symbols of this was the perpetuation of the foot-binding ritual that perpetuated in rural China. So ultimately, the Chinese government said, stop, and no one listened. <laughs> so despite the power of the Chinese government, they created a campaign, or a message, through Miss Little's Natural Foot Society, a fashion leak that suddenly made it now fashionable to have natural unbound feet. And this turned out to be wildly more successful, posing the difference between power and effective communication, which is reflected in today's, oh, here it is, in today's Apache proverb. It is better to have less thunder in the mouth and more lightning in the hand. This proverb suggests that having lightning in the hand or the capability to enact power is more important than being able to talk about it or communicate with thunder in the mouth. But we have to disagree with this assertion because ultimately we have to be able to communicate our power in order to be effective. And we can see that this is the case first by seeing how our message, how our, how our power, we are powerless unless we can convey our messages. And second, we also must be able to back up our messages with the power to enact our goals. Now we can first disagree with the Apache proverb, which would suggest that ultimately, communication is less important than power, by seeing how ultimately, unless we can convey our goals, we are unable to enact them. We can see this by first looking to the Gerber African baby food campaign, and second, looking to the Russian smallpox epidemic. Now the Gerber baby food campaign decided to branch out into African communities and economies early in the 1990s. Now, the famous Gerber baby food ad depicts a picture of a baby on the label. However, in many North African nations, because of the diversity of languages, food products put pictures rather than words on the label. So when the picture of the baby was introduced on Gerber baby food <laughs> bottles in Africa, people were horrified at the suggestion that perhaps these contained actual babies as food. <laughs> Thus, it was an ultimate marketing disaster. And this is because while they had a valuable, important product that was tangible and real, they were unable to convey this effectively to their desired markets. And as a result, despite their power to please consumers, their message foiled them. We can see this also reflected in the Russian smallpox epidemic in the 1700s, in which Moscow was the splash point of a spread of the disease. However, one individual, the Archbishop of Moscow, understood enlightenment principles. And so what he did was he tried to remove the statues of, of, the, of the Virgin Mary, which was used as a sacred point where many sick people gathered. Unfortunately, as they kissed her feet, that only spread more smallpox. And as he tried to explain this, the fact that none of the citizens of Moscow had any understanding of how diseases spread, they ultimately just thought they were trying to take away their religion. And as he removed the statue, they stormed his house and burned them. While he had accurate information and the true power of accuracy to help these people, 
because he wasn't able to effectively convey the principles to the people he was trying to help, his power was lost because his message went unheard. Now we can further disagree with the Apache proverb, which suggests that power and capability is more important than communication, by seeing that ultimately, we must have both the capability as well as the ability to convey our message. And paired together, that is when we are most successful. And we can see this, first, by looking to the 100 Flowers Movement, and second, to the life of Equiano. First, we can look to the 100 Flowers Movement in China, in which in the 1950s, Mao Zedong decided to suspend his incredibly repressive communist regime for the 100 Flowers Movement, which encouraged dissidents and intellectuals to speak out and criticize the Chinese government. However, ultimately, he was really surprised at how many people were unhappy with communist China. And by the, after, being after being incredibly startled by the amount of dissent, he suddenly shut down the program and interned all of the intellectuals. Now, he was, was unsuccessful, ultimately, because as the proverb suggests, he had the message, but not the power or the willingness to go through with the changes that he had hoped would be, would be implemented as a result. Now, further, we can see this revolting reflected in the life of Equiano, an autobiographical story of a slave from the 1700s, the first book of its kind. Why Equiano was important is that ultimately, he had a message to give to people, and he, because of his unique experiences of having a kind owner, he had the ability to read and write, which allowed him to convey his story and message to the people, and he is in fact considered one of the fathers of the abolitionist movement within Great Britain. As a result, because he had both the power and capability of message, as well as the personal experience to share his message, he was far more powerful. By combining the ideas of both thunder and lightning, he was truly able to make his message both effective and widely heard, thus suggesting that the Apache proverb is partially accurate, but it dismisses the idea of combining both the power of speech as well as influence. So returning to today's Apache proverb, it is better to have less thunder in the mouth and more lightning of the hand. We disagreed with the assertion that power is more important than communication. First, because we saw that without the ability to convey our messages, they are ineffective. And second, that we must ultimately be able to back up the messages we share with the ability to enact change and better our society around us. Next up, we have these. Oh, you didn't get your time signals yet, did you? I didn't. Then before everyone starts clapping for you, Robert. <clears throat> Hi. So 30 second verbal warnings during prep time. Five minutes on down. 30, 15, last five. Shut up. Okay. okay. D6 Dan Cutter, everyone. Time begins. Thirty seconds.
One minute. One thirty. The character of Mac from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia loves wearing cut-off t-shirts to show off his huge guns and loves doing sweet karate moves to impress all sorts of chicks. And people are constantly hammering on Mac because his sole focus in life is on his physical appearance, when in reality he actually doesn't have a very impressive physical appearance. He actually just thinks he looks really great all the time. And so because of this, his friends are constantly hammering on him for not being as intelligent as everyone else around him. And basically saying that Mac is less than because he values his physical appearance more than mental capacity that he has. And this idea of valuing one positive characteristic such as physicality over mentality leads me to today's quotation, from, uh, which is an Apache proverb. It is better to have less thunder in the mouth and more lightning in the hand. What this proverb is telling us is that physicality, or having lightning in your hand, is more important than having a strong mental capacity, or lightning in your mouth. However, we can disagree with this quotation today on the justification that no single positive attribute is greater than one other. Having thunder in your mouth is not, better than, not necessarily better than having lightning in your hand. And we can see why this is true today by first observing that fingers can be just as good as strong people, or secondly, we can observe that positive characteristics matter to your own interpretation, not how other people view you. But first, we have to understand that no one person is greater than anyone else. Specifically, our quotation is talking about people with, uh, with strong hands being better than people with strong mouths. However, we need to understand that thinkers can be just as capable as anyone with a strong physical appearance. And we can see why this is true today by first looking towards the example of Pittsburgh Pirates pitcher in the 1970s, Doc Ellis, before secondly, Gloria Sinem. But first, we will look towards the example of Doc Ellis, who in 1976, for the Pittsburgh Pirates, he was just a pretty typical average pitcher. And then, one day before he went out to pitch, he took LSD and threw a perfect game! <laughs> Instead of relying on solely his physical capabilities, he tapped into something different, his mental capabilities, and it helped carry him on, showing that allowing for freedom of thinking rather than just allowing on his physical capabilities led Doc Ellis to have the absolute best game of his entire career. But furthermore, we can see the example of how thinkers are just as important as people with strong physical appearances. And we can observe this by first looking towards, the, uh, towards, looking towards Gloria Steinem. Now, Gloria Steinem, ended up uh, who is a famous feminist, ended up marrying David Bale, who is the father of Christian Bale. And that made for an awkward dinner conversation because Gloria Steinem was incredibly against Christian starring an American psycho because she viewed it as being an anti-feminist movie. However, Gloria actually ended up being the champion in this as she allowed Christian Bale to show some regret for his decisions in the role and admitting to the fact that the movie may have possibly been anti-feminist. Gloria Steinem used her mind to combat a, a movie that relied heavily on violence and aggression. So Gloria Steinem and Doc Ellis show us that thinkers can be just as capable as anyone with a strong physical appearance or lightning in their hand. But lastly, we can see that furthermore, it is up to your own interpretation of what is most important in your life. Physical characteristics are, are no physical characteristic is inherently better than one another. And we can observe this by first looking towards Michael Sandel, or secondly, cultural relativism. But first, we can look towards Michael Sandel, a famous Harvard philosopher who is well known for his theories that he puts forth, which basically means that society values certain things, and because of that, those things are popular. Such as football, we live in a country where aggression and violence is idolized, so because of that, football is incredibly popular. But this doesn't mean that football is inherently better than any other sport or activity that people choose to partake in. Although uh, curling is not a super popular sport, that doesn't mean that it is inherently worse than football. 
It is up to your own interpretation for what is most important in your life. And finally, we can see that the theory of cultural relativism further enforces this idea that each person's characteristics and interpretations of our world is what matters. Now, cultural relativism is basically the idea that tradition is inherently wrong and any culture is allowed to do whatever they want in their life. Specifically, an Inuit tribe in Alaska believes that it is okay to eat their own dead. This is their own thing that they have been doing for countless of centuries, and it's something that is hugely important to their culture. So the theory of cultural relativism and Michael Sandel show us that each person's interpretation is what truly matters when it comes to our world. So in returning to the Apache proverb, it is better to have less thunder in the mouth and more lightning in the hand. We saw that, uh, that uh, physicality is more important than physical strength. However, we disagreed with this today on the justification that no single type of attribute in our world is inherently better than one another. So like with Doc Ellis, if you want to have success, just take LSD. <laughs> And A6, Aaron Pierce. seconds. One minute. One thirty. In Chuck Palahniuk's novel, Choke, which is surprisingly not about Peyton Manning at all. <laughs> In the novel, Choke, we follow the protagonist who decides that he will go to restaurants and pretend to be choking because this will lead other patrons of the restaurants to pity him, save his life, and then treat him wonderfully for the rest of it. And this idea of him going to a place and being what he isn't, or being open with something that may or may not be true, is reflected in today's quotation, which is the Apache proverb, it is better to have less thunder in the mouth and more lightning in the hand. Or instead of,
doing things outwardly, being the thunder in the mouth, we should conceal our intentions, or have lightning in the hand, hidden ulterior motives. And we must disagree with this on two main lines of analysis. First, that others cannot react to things that we keep hidden. And second, the idea that denied or ulterior motives are often difficult, rather, often have a difficult time affecting other things. But initially, we need to understand that others outside of ourselves very rarely can react to what we keep hidden. And not much of a secret. <laughs> but to see this, we need to look at the idea of exposure theory and apply it to Jesus on Jesus therapy, which is a real thing. <laughs> Exposure theory effectively states that there is, if there is anything, more notably than anything, a phobia that a person has, it can only be addressed openly. It is something that we must address in the open and cannot keep hidden. You can only attack it head on. And this applies more than to just phobias, and also to people's delusional beliefs about themselves and their importance in the world. Which brings us to Jesus on Jesus therapy which is not a mispronounced Hispanic male porno. <laughs> but Jesus on Jesus therapy is instead the idea that people who have messianic delusions, or the belief that they are the second coming of Christ, the only way to cure most of them, or at least the most effective one, is to put them in a room with another person who has these same delusions. Because if they are in fact the second coming of Christ, there certainly couldn't be another. And it turns out that most times, they solve each other's problems. It's this great system. It works out perfectly. <laughs> but it's only because they're able to be open about these things that any progress is made. It is only because they have more thunder in their mouths and they're willing to tell the other Jesus in the room that they are, in fact, the Jesus in the room, that they are able to make any progress. It is not the lightning in the hand or what they keep hidden that makes any difference in the situation. But beyond that, we see that the lightning in the hand, or what we keep hidden, often has a very difficult time affecting other things. And we can see this through the, theory, the philosophical theory of extrojection, and applying this to the movie Beast of the Southern Wild. Extrojection effectively states that the best way to operate as a human being is to deny everything your brain tells you about what you're feeling. It's effectively saying that like when I was sitting in the hallway, but fighting the urges to either take a nap or cry, since I denied both of those and came in here, I will be better off. Now, we can apply this to the movie Beasts of the Southern Wild. The, since we are denying the lightning in the hand and instead acting with the thunder in the mouth, we see this being put into place with the protagonist of Beasts of the Southern Wild, played by Kevin A. Wallace, and I forget her character's name. Probably wasn't even important. But we see she plays a small girl who is taught by her father to never cry, or to never outwardly show emotion. And throughout the entirety of the movie, she does just this. She denies it in its entirety, vehemently from start till very near the end. When, spoiler alert everybody in the room, um, her father dies at the end, and it's incredibly depressing, and maybe you shouldn't watch it now that I've told you and you know how it ends. But we see she is able to, with him at the end of the movie, shed a tear, and it is this catharsis of sorts, the thunder in her mouth, the tears that outwardly come that make her fulfilled, that allow her to be the full person that she was going to be throughout the entire story, but that she could not be while she had put these restrictions on herself of extrojecting all of her feelings showing clearly that what we keep hidden, her feelings, have a hard time affecting anything. She was only effective when she let them out. So, in returning to today's quote, well, proverb, it is better to have less thunder in the mouth and more lightning in the hand, from the Apaches, we see they're effectively saying it's better to keep your motives hidden and not be open with them, but we must disagree with this. First on the grounds that others cannot react to what we keep hidden. And second, on the ground that things that we keep hidden have a very difficult time affecting anything outside of ourselves. So, in returning to Cho, he kept it hidden that he was this awful, awful person. <laughs> Until the end, when everybody finds out and hates him. So, we see that him being his true self begins to pay off because he can be his own self and accept himself as he is.